But today's going to be a very fascinating Things Hidden program today. We have with us two individuals who've been leaders in understanding mimetic theory through the years, understanding desire, understanding uh, scapegoating, and understanding all of it through the lens of a biblical worldview. We have with us Dr. Jean-Michel Ugorlian, who's an American-French neuropsychiatrist and psychologist. Uh, he's published several books on the subject that we're talking about today, mimetic uh, psychology, books like The Mimetic Brain and uh, Puppet of Desire, and several new ones that we can talk about. And we're also joined by Gil Bailey, who's the founder of the Cornerstone Forum and someone who has done a lot of great work integrating mimetic theory with theology. And you have a new book out as well, uh, uh, Mr. Bailey. So we're going to talk about that a little bit too, uh, as we continue, but just wanted to welcome you both to this discussion. Thank you, David. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you, David. Now you guys, uh, this is like kind of a, a getting the band back together for a reunion tour. So I like this. <laughs> yeah, now that, uh, uh, listen, um, my, my new book has just come out by Michigan State University Press. It's called Alterity. Okay. Alterity has just come out in, in, in Michigan State University Press. Okay. Very good. Just come out. I'll rush out and get it. <laughs> well, very good. And, and uh, uh, Gil, you have a book coming out soon too, right? Let's we'll just talk about it up, up front. I did. Uh, I mean, I do. It will come out within the next couple of months, I think. I'm, I'm on the verge of sending the, the uh, corrected proofs back. Uh, so I think it'll be out. It's called uh, the, the Apocalypse of the Sovereign Self. The Apocalypse uh, of the Sovereign Self. Very interesting. Right. Yeah. Recovering so, a Christian understanding of the mystery of person. Ah, oh, very, very interesting. Yeah. That's so what fascinating. Is, yeah. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the book, what we can learn from that. And then I want to ask uh, Dr. Gorlian to do so for his book, Alterity. Yeah. Well, I, I think both of us probably have been involved in the uh, exploration of, of what uh, Rene called interdividuality. And uh, it, for me, the more I worked with Rene in his later years and the more I grew old myself, the more I realized how, uh, how important the Christian dynamic was, not only in Rene's work, but also in life itself. And so what I've tried to do is, is move, is to, is create a bridge between what you might call anthropological, see this is these multi-syllabic words, the anthrop anthropological interdividuality and Christian interdividuality. And of course they complement each other, but they're nuanced in, in different ways. And so my book is is an effort, first of all, first of all to survey how the how the autonomous uh, self emerged as the operating principle of late modernity and the crisis it's now in because it fails to come to grips with the whole mimetic reality uh, and then to and then deposit what Christianity offers uh, in terms of understanding of that particular mystery. So that's mine. Very interesting. And Dr. And, Gorlian, what's your alterity book about? We've talked about it before, but for listeners for the first time. Not well, here. alterity is just, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to demonstrate or to just talk about the, the vertical alterity. I mean, God created Adam and he's creating every, everything that is alive uh, on earth in the world. He creates men, animals, you know, everything. All this wouldn't exist if God didn't create it. But then the human being starts living. And as he starts living, he has a horizontal alterity that produces him. In other words, mimetic desire uh, entails 
the 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 birth of a new self and finally we understand that if there is mimetic desire there can be no such a thing as a individual self and and the, the, every, what happens is that the the relationship between two entities meeting and the suggestion imitation come and go arrows will create in each in each pole something that can be called a self and my friend Eugene Webb you know called that the self between you know in other words we're always in contact with with the other and this is a, a horizontal alterity that that creates the selves the various selves that constitute us because we have a series of models that we follow we 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 have the models first first of all the compulsory models like that our parents if if we're born in america we speak american and if we're born in france we speak french and we we have no choice and you know nobody asks us whether we would like this that or the other but then as we grow a little bit more we get a little bit away from the models of the parents we model on our uh, friends at school, our teachers, our professors, and gradually we can model also on the various great philosophers and talkers and 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 people who have written impressive books, and uh, we model gradually on on several models. And I think modeling on several models is is a very good, healthy thing because if we hang on and model on just one model, we become fanatics. In other words, if you are just a communist and nothing else, and you don't want to hear about anything else, you don't even want to discuss the possibility of another possibility, then you're fanatic. Same thing today with, uh, with some people who think that uh, if you're not Islamic, then you have to be killed. These people are fanatics. You have to be open. And I think that uh, Girard was, was uh, leading in this field because he accepted, you know, the fact that we can have several models and we end up by finding out that we are, as we are, as we exist, we are the patchwork. We are a patchwork of all the models that we have success, you know, successively uh, uh, imitated throughout our life and and then and, and this is why we we cannot i mean i cannot adhere i cannot agree with the actual now uh, sort of uh, tendency of wokeism that says that you know the most important thing is our little self and that we can decide ourselves what do we want to be and that we have nothing to do with the, with models or anything we, we could just decide that uh, okay, uh, I, I may look like a man, but in fact, I'm a woman. Um, <laughs> and uh, and the, the only, the, the, the even, the, the mere fact of saying that I'm a man is really very bad. It's, I mean, it's an insult to nature and to, to self, to self freedom. So you have to accept to say, you know, I'm, uh, I don't know. <laughs> so finally, we will have we will end up with a society that has cut all roots and that will be in, in terrible turmoil. And if you look at the world now, you realize that uh, uh, we may be uh, in, the, in the beginning of, of the end. I mean, uh, uh, Rene was talking about the apocalypse to, mm -hmm. uh, to, to happen soon. And I think that if we keep tickling uh, Russia and China and so on, we may end up, you know, living through apocalypse. Yeah. Well, or, it's or great. Maybe... It's great that we got the band back together just in time for the final <laughs> conclusion. <laughs> I want to. I want to speak about this for a moment. This is a, the elephant in the room, of course, is that you two were great contemporaries of the late great Rene Girard, and and uh, and there was others, folks like Robert Hamilton Kelly, who has passed, and uh, you know Raymond Schwager, who has passed. And Rene Girard, of course, passed in 2015. But you two are still out there 
pushing the uh, you know pushing the theory and pushing the 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 discipline that you that has been developed between uh, these contemporaries forward. And I really have to commend you for that for not resting in the nice easy retirement, but continually pushing ideas forward. Thank you for doing that, and thank you both well, for. Thank- yeah. Thank you, thank you, David, for 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 thinking about it, and I really think that you know, I've I've for the past forty years, since, ever since I met Rene, I have you know Rene's thoughts has influenced all sorts of sciences, human sciences, you know, politics, theology, economics, whatever. I have concentrated only on my field, which is psychology and psychiatry. I haven't dealt with the other fields. You know, and uh, I would like now to maybe try to find to, to to write the last book, in which I would like to show that actually the Bible and the Gospels are actually mimetic lessons, lessons in mimetic theory, and that they sort of show us that they teach us mimetic theory, if we know how to read them. But of course, we have to read them not, not as believers, not as, you know, not, not by praying, but just by reading them as we would read Homer or, uh, you know, uh, Odyssey or, you know, uh, Victor Hugo or whatever. Yo, yo, I, I would like to say, well, well, I would like to know, to know what Gil thinks about this. Yeah. Aspect. I think it, it's it, it's just what I've been trying to do in this book that I'm writing. Uh, well, there you are. So there you are. You I, see we, I completely agree. I think you guys I, need I, to do some dialogues together and make a book too <laughs> together. <laughs> well, you yeah, know, if, if we were if we were uh, geographically closer, we would do this immediately. That would, yes. be, that would be beautiful. I would don't, I would only say that it's possible to read uh, the the Bible religiously and anthropologically at the same time. And yes, so, yes, yes. And so I, I, I think the, the, the religious, the Christocentric uh, quality of the New Testament is uh, something that informs the reader uh, in ways that are beyond intellectual comprehension, so that it's possible to to clearly see the anthropological implications at the same time that you see sort of the existential one. And and what you just said, uh, Joe Michelle, about um, about the convergence, I think of Paul's I live now, not I, but Christ lives in me, is such a central text uh, for understanding the way in which uh, the theological or metaphysical implications of the New Testament uh, affect the, the the reader or the 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 one who's a subject to it. So I the way you described your your current book, and then the what you said about one that might come next is uh, music to my ears because. It, it nothing would give me more a uh, sense of assurance than to know that Jean Michel Ugulion and Joe Bailey are on the same page. Oh, they have been for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, uh, yeah, you know, Rene uh, uh, had written many, many. I mean, uh, you you remember the the things hidden since the beginning of the world, and so on, so forth. And uh, he had commented on the Bible and the Passion of Christ and so on, but he was he was very pious. He was a very, he very was. He, yeah. He was a very strong believer. And uh, one of the, my last visits to to uh, Rene in in Stanford uh, on on Sunday, he said, "You see, uh, your other friends may take you to." You know, to bowl games or to <laughs> to have nice fun and so on. But I will take you to mass. <laughs> uh huh. Absolutely. I went with I went with Renee and Martha to mass uh, on Sundays, 
a yeah. number of times, and it, uh, it, it was so palpable, uh, his, his deep faith. And it's it, very, it, very, very deep faith. But, uh, but, and, and he thought that everything he had written was, had reinforced his faith. Uh -huh. And that he, he didn't, and that he f could find in all his books and all his research in Bible and Gospels and so on, a, a, a new reason to, uh, to have faith. Uh, of course, you know, uh, I, I have another idea which is, you know, goes along with the ideas of, that the philosopher called Simon Weil. Oh, Simon yes. Weil. The, the heaven, how, how do you say it in English? The heaviness and the grace? The, the, la pesanteur et la grâce, the heaviness and the grace or the... the, uh, the, uh, the, the gravity, the, uh, gravity and grace. Gravity, gravity uh, and grace. Yeah. And I think yeah. that, and I think that you cannot, you see there, there's two spiritualities, one, har, one vertical mm -hmm. in which you, you try to make every effort to go up to God, but that then you have a problem with gravity. But if you try to eliminate everything that is gravity in your life, which is, in my view, essentially mimetic rivalry and you know all those mimetic desires that 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 cling us down to earth, to, to 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 the to the earth, then you may have or not. That's not our decision, but it's the decision of God whether we have grace or not. Uh -huh. But but there's nothing we can do about that. We cannot because there is a a, a, a French philosopher who wrote. A new book. He's very popular in France. He has written over a hundred books called Michel Onfray. Michel Onfray. And he says, I have asked God to send his grace to me. And he didn't. So my conclusion is that God doesn't exist. <laughs> so you, cannot, you cannot threaten God by saying, listen, if you don't show up, I will decide that you don't exist. <laughs> if you don't show up, I'm going to write a book saying you don't exist. <laughs> exactly. And he wrote a book saying that he doesn't exist because I have summoned him to show up. And he didn't. <laughs> so, so I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, to try in the next book to, to explain that you cannot do that with God. I mean, you can, you can prepare yourself and eventually, you know, be as ready as possible to to have to receive the grace, but you cannot force him to send it <laughs> as his decision, not yours. Now, why is his? Why does he decide for this or not? That we cannot know. Yeah, <laughs> you, know, you know, Thomas Merton, the, the the monk poet, had a poem called Grace's House, and I can't re re repeat it, but he's. He said, Grace lives up, up on the sunlit green hill, and there's an uncrossed crystal river between us and her. We can't get to her. All we can do, it, but he said, her mailbox is full of valentines. <laughs> 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 For those who are trying to get Grace, but he says, there's, there's no road to Grace's house, which is the same thing as you're saying. That it That's has, right. You can't. It has to come from up. To down, right. exactly. you cannot you cannot climb up to God because no matter what, how much you know you you uh, you don't eat and you beat yourself up and and you and you sacrifice and you don't and you don't sleep and you pray all day, <laughs> you, you you cannot go up. <laughs> That's so funny to hear that because you know in American Christianity sometimes Catholics get accused of having a works righteousness, you know, and yet here we have two Catholics saying it's grace that, that, that is what saves. Oh, ab absolutely. <laughs> Which, if, <laughs> yeah. Is, you know, that's a kind of a, a characterization, a characterization. It's, it's, it's very, it's very true. interesting. It's very interesting. It's very interesting. And uh, so this is what I call horizontal uh, spirituality. In other words, you can improve yourself and just try to be as ready as possible 
to receive eventually grace. But you may or may not receive it because that's not your mm -hmm. decision. Mm -hmm. and, and you cannot yeah. threaten, you know, you can you cannot tell God, listen, if you don't come up and show up, <laughs> then you don't exist. Yeah. <laughs> and, so and you know, <laughs> Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa lived uh, in a, in many ways, a, a, a spiritually barren existence for many years. Uh, she was doing what she knew she was called to do. But that ex that profound reassurance and so on uh, wasn't there, but she just kept at it, which is incredibly admirable. It's easy enough, if, or it's not easy, but uh, if you're constantly being wa washed in grace, uh, one can persevere. But uh, the, the the desert time is uh, it is. Is the is the lot of most of us, at least for part of our lives. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you feel like well, we're think... in a desert time now, culturally yeah. in the West? Do you feel like we're oh. in a desert time collectively in the West right now? I certainly do. I although, although I mean, I hope you know, spring is eternal. But I must say that, as Jean Michel said. When you look around at at the deterioration, and from and from for me, it's it's the crisis of uh, of it's it's the crisis of undifferentiation because it's it's the loss of the Christian ballast of our civilization. People think that that a, a civilization uh, equivalent to what we've had for the last several hundred years can survive without Christianity is the most naive thing in the world. Uh, so this is, we are founded on a Judeo-Christian foundation and those people who think you can just jerk that rug out from under us and we'll go happily along are making a huge mistake. I think, I think that uh, I, I fully agree. I think the Catholicism is losing now uh, influence, mm -hmm. weight in in the world. And I think it's a little bit our fault, and mm -hmm. uh, especially the philosophy of the new Pope, Pope Francis, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. who, and my, my, my reaction when he ca canceled, when he forbid the to say the mass in latin and the priest would be you know showing his back to the people and, mm -hmm. and doing the thing my 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 answer was if there is no secret there is no sacred mm -hmm. and so you have to 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 put up some kind you know, of a secret of something that's happening because it's not just, it, it, it's, it's something very, very incredible and important that suddenly the priest takes a piece of bread and that becomes the body of Christ. It's not something you can do just out in the open air and mm -hmm. in front of everybody. You have to cover it with certain rituals and and make it a little bit, secret and 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 then sacred and if you don't do that you lose people you, you, people's faith mm. because they don't see what they have to believe in wow. they, they they think you know nothing has happened and 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 that is what is actually presently now in my opinion weakening and maybe unfortunately destroying uh the uh the, the 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 Catholic or, or the Christian faith in general, hmm. and uh, there is there is some people, some Christians, who are still clinging on that aspect of things. That's the Orthodox people, you know, they're the Eastern people, and this is, in my opinion, one of the underlying major uh, lines of divorce 
or conflict between the Russian and and all the Orthodox uh, nations and the Catholic nations and the Western nations, you know. <clears throat> I think there's there's something there also. That the it's Orthodox just, nations are keeping the Lord's Supper hidden <coughs> and sacred that by that. <coughs> yeah, but <coughs> they make people understand that something is happening. Yeah, that's really but, important. You, you know, know that if the liturgy doesn't convey that some profound event is happening, then it's it's you know it's the the pulpit takes over. If 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 the, if the altar becomes a, a, a mere a symbolic act, there's nothing left but the pulpit. And exactly, it, exactly. Yeah. And you know, I think that <clears throat> the, the, some Catholics are still very conscious of that. One of whom is Cardinal Sarah. Yes, indeed. Yes, Cardinal Sarah, who is a, a, an African uh, priest. And I was lucky enough to attend a mass said by Cardinal Sarah. And uh -huh. while he's doing it, you feel that something is happening. He's not just making gestures. Yes. He really makes you feel that deep inside himself, he is convinced and he takes the time. He doesn't rush. Mm -hmm. When he kneels down, he stays in, in, on his knees for a long while. You uh -huh. see, I mean, all those gestures, which look ridiculous to the new priests and so on in Rome, are not. They, in fact, you know, they, they, they are very important. And, and when you see a mass said by Cardinal Sarah, you, 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 you are forced to think that something has happened. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you, when you take a, a common mass, you know, in, in France or anything said by a priest who's just wearing a, a white gown, you know, like, like a doctor, <laughs> uh -huh. and, who, and who faces the audience. Uh -huh. And you can see everything he's doing, and you see that he's not doing anything fantastic. And and so you can't imagine that something is happening. And therefore, everybody, uh, you know, uh, eats sandwiches and smokes and, 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 and talks and, uh, and laughs and everything. No one, no one is in real concentration for, for faith. Uh -huh. And I think this is very important. You cannot, you cannot do anything important without a ritual. That's so. I want to ask a question about that for both of you. When you <clears throat> is that suggesting that you know because Jesus talks a lot about when when people are healed in the New Testament, he says it's because of, it's because of your faith. You know, your faith. You believe, right? And the belief and and is is that suggesting that the real presence is only real when the people believe it's there? And if they don't truly believe it's there, then it's not there? Or is that not what you're no, saying? I, I wouldn't say that, but but it's important. The reason people are gathered is so they can take part in it. Uh, but And if and, and in your head, you may, I mean, you may say, oh yeah, this is the body and blood of Christ. Uh, but if you don't experience that, at least in some attenuated way, it becomes simply a theory. But to be, to, I mean, to say, if Mass is said appropriately, and if the people, those who attend it are appropriately uh, disposed, uh, it has, it has effect. And it, uh, it especially has a cumulative effect, but I, I, agree, I agree completely that we've watered the, the liturgy down. I think it's, I think it's the case that I, ha I know friends, priest friends of mine, who can say the new, the new, the new mass, the watered down mass, who can say it with all the profundity, so it can the new, the new order can be. Uh, a, a conduit for the mystery, but it very often is is not as much 
are much diminished. And and that's why we have, I mean, in a way we have to wait, we, the, we Catholics have to wait for the Nigerians to take over the church. Uh, yes, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But you see, because because faith, faith, like everything else, is mimetic. So if yes. the if the priest shows that he really believes in what he's doing, we model our belief yes. mimetically on his. But if he behaves as if he's doing something, as if he was just you know, uh, I don't know. Uh, cooking a, a pizza, yeah. then, a symbolic, <laughs> yeah, a symbolic then, act. Then, then we mimetically do mm -hmm. like him. We don't. We don't believe. Wow. We don't have faith. Right. And 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 Sarah's faith is contagious. Yes. In other words, yes. it it entails mimetic faith. Everything is mimetic. Yes. We don't. We must not ever forget this. Rene told yeah. us. <laughs> You know, I had I had the great good fortune to have dinner with like, Cardinal Sarah one time, and oh, you uh, did, even, uh -huh. even even you know, in, in just in, in the course of dinner conversations on both his deep faith and his profound humanity and his his uh, generosity of spirit, his humor, is just an extraordinary human being. And, yes. and I, after after that, I, I I just thought, if only he could be Pope. <laughs> yes, only... unfortunately, I think I'm afraid that he is too old now. Even uh, if is, the Pope yeah. passes away, yeah. he's too old. He is too old. But he was also very close to the former Pope uh, yeah. Benedict the Sixteenth, who had about the same ideas and who had allowed specifically the Mass to be. Uh, celebrated in Latin and in the uh, traditional way. And Pope Francis abolished that. He he said, no, it's forbidden. From now on, you have to do it like Vatican II Council, whatever. And I think he is, I think personally, mimetically, it's a mistake. Yeah, sure. You know? uh, speaking about the mystery you mentioned, I wanted to ask, what do you think of Marshall McLuhan? He was a you know, media theorist, but he was also a devout Catholic. And he said that when they introduced the uh, electronic uh, microphone to amplify the voice of the priest, that was an attack on the mystery of the uh, Latin mass too, because this is supposed to be something you hear whispering. You're not supposed to hear it amplified for everybody in the back and everybody hear it perfectly in a kind of synthetic form. Well, it depends how many people you have in the in, in the in the, uh -huh. in the church. I mean, if you have three or four or thirty people, you can do without the electronic uh, microphone. But if you have five hundred or five thousand people, you need the microphone because otherwise, <laughs> nobody well, will pay any attention. <laughs> well, Saint Augustine could do it, but I think in our time, it takes. <laughs> it, we, we need something a little help. But yeah, I do you must. Think that the, 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 the words of consecration, of course, uh, should uh, should be spoken reverently and in the, in tones that uh, correspond to its gravity. Exactly. You, you, they, you, they mustn't be spoken averagely. This mm -hmm. is why many Oriental Oriental rights, uh, Catholic rights, or even Orthodox rights, they don't, uh, consecration is not spoken. They sing it. Mm -hmm. So when you sing it, you show that it's not just talk. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, it's, it's another gadget, <laughs> but it's, it may be also another path. But you see, if you just speak as if you were speaking to, as we're speaking now, you know, then, then people say, okay, well, nothing's happening. So right. they, they can't, they can't, you, you, you have to make them mimetically believe by believing yourself. And I'm afraid to say that many priests nowadays do not, in my opinion, have real faith. Well, I, I remember Rene making remarks like that many times. You did, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you see? 
we have the same appreciation <laughs> of the situation, which is pessimistic, of course. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the, the problem, you see, is that another question, which, which is not psychological, but theological. Since uh, Christ died, was, was crucified, his last words, I mean, to his father, his father being his own self, I mean, divided because uh, he said, you know, I've been here among these people. I've lived here for 33 years. And let me sum up for you, summarize the whole situation. They don't know what the hell they are doing. <laughs> And that is very, very Girardian. In other words, mm -hmm. the mimetic desire leads you to do things you're not, you don't know that you're doing. And that is his final message. But what happened is, if you read the Bible, you see that God is very active in the Bible. He shows up every minute and he helps the people to go out of Egypt. He opens the sea. He does this, he does that, he helps them in the war, he, he does And since the passion of Christ, he disappears. He has never appeared again. Because Christ has told us everything that he could possibly tell us. And if we still do not read and understand, well, then there's it's no way, <laughs> no reason why he should appear. You know, he's, he's discouraged. The only person... Mm -hmm that sometimes appears because of her motherly uh, kindness and tenderness is the Virgin who mm -hmm. has appeared a few times, you know, in Fatima, in Lourdes and so on, because she says, you know, those poor people, you know, I have to give them a little bit of hope and remind them about, but, uh, but, 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 but uh, uh, the Christ himself doesn't appear. <laughs> He has you know, given up. <laughs> Jean Michel, we may be putting we might be uh, putting David in a spot because I think at least a, a, a great portion, if not the vast majority of David's audience are are not Catholic and all that. And I that's my guess. I could be wrong. But so they're tuning into this and listening to these two old guys talk, talk about talk about the church in yeah. churchy terms. <laughs> well, that's probably. fine. Yeah, no. We don't. We, we don't. No, no, David. Uh, we don't want to to undermine uh, the, the 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 Christianity. I mean, we 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 what we're saying is just the things that we to us seem to be going in the wrong direction from the mimetic point of view. Yeah. Again. But uh, by no way, but by, in, in no means, we are trying to undermine the belief or the faith. Much to the contrary, we're trying to see how to restore and, and strengthen the faith of the people. Because you see now, they are again falling into the grips of, of, uh, of the evil. They are mimetically, you know, in rivalry. You see, but, Putin, you know, Putin and Zelensky are mimetic rivals. Yeah. If you analyze this, and none of them would give up anything until the other one is dead. And if they continue like this, we may all go. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Because because there's if you can't stop a war, then there is nothing you can do. And that's happened yeah. twice in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. First, First World War, yeah. Second World War, always because of stupid things. Mm -hmm. The First World War, if you think about it, all the leaders, all the, the emperors and the kings, they were just cousins of each other. They were all grandchildren, great-grandchildren of Queen Victoria, the King of England, the Kaiser of, of Germany, the Tsar of Russia, the, 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 the Emperor of Austria, they were all related to Queen Victoria. They were all cousins. 
they, they should have been able to 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 get together and sort it out. No, nothing. No, they they just went into the most horrible butchery, uh, uh, and then the Second World War. I mean, of course, then it's even worse, even worse. Let me see. By, by the millions, and not only in, in Europe, in China, uh, Mao Zedong with the with the long walk and so on, he he killed millions and millions and millions of people. And the more million people he killed, the greater th the greater man he was considered to be. <laughs> you know, the genius. And as a, so, it's a little bit discouraging to think that the more million people you killed with the the more they think that you're a genius. <laughs> the, you, the, um, and, you know, you even get you know, people trying to say Stalin was great now. Younger people in America are trying to say that, and that's totally, and they're saying, you know, they're Catholic, and they're saying that, and I'm thinking to myself, that's not Christian to say. Stalin is great in the kingdom of Satan, not great in the kingdom of heaven in terms of how we evaluate greatness. But I, I, you mentioned China, and this week as we're recording this, We've had the announcement that, I think it was last week by now, that Iran and Saudi Arabia have brokered a peace deal with China. China has brokered a peace deal between these two warring parties. Um, that, And I think about Jesus saying, blessed are the peacemakers. And what does it say about our culture today that it's China, not so-called Christian-influenced West, that's brokering peace deals between places? I mean, uh, Jean-Michel Rogorlian, you're in uh, Switzerland, which used to be the place where all these types of deals were being brokered. Now, that place of peace, even though there's a lot of evil and corruption, everybody's always reminded of that daily in the American media. In China, there's a lot of corruption there. But nevertheless, why is it that China is now brokering peace deals between Saudi Arabia and Iran? And what does that say about our times? Well, I don't know. I, I will try to answer that. I think uh, in our time in the West, especially in Europe, people, people in general are craving for authority. They need somebody strong to tell them what to do and who takes care of them in a way. And so they're fascinated by people like Putin or by the guys in Iran or by China, of course. So they tend to go to China because they, they feel there is an authority there. there, there is a power. Whereas, for instance, the Pope has made a speech. He said, we should stop the war between the two, uh, you know, uh, warrior bit between Ukraine and, and Russia, the two, the two enemies. And, you know, all the French press was insulting the Pope, saying, how can he possibly put on the same level the aggressor and the victim? The aggressor is clearly Putin, and the victim is clearly Ukraine. So he has to say it. He has to say Ukraine has to win and Russia has to be beaten. And the Pope was only trying to, you know, to do that. And, and so, But the Pope does not have the the, the 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 authority or the power or the strength or the weight of Xi Jinping. This is the problem. Mm. You see? When because the in our quest for earthly make... in our quest for earthly mimetic role models, we still want the strong man. We want the one with teeth. Yeah, I mean look look now if if you look into history, who are the main figures that fascinate you. Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, you know, and you don't, you know, uh, you don't judge them morally that they have killed many people. They did kill a lot of people. But you judge them because they had authority, power, and they knew what they were doing. Napoleon, and so on and so forth. And this is one of the explanations for Stalin's you know, sort of uh, new uh, <laughs> uh, uh, publicity, you know, they, 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 because the Russians now feel that they are weak, not respected, 
that the whole world think they are now a third world country and they regret the times when Stalin was ruling Europe. Mm -hmm. Although he had to pay for, you know, although he paid that by killing 20 million, or I don't know how many people, you know, in, in, in the Gulag and so on and so forth. But now they forget that aspect and they concentrate on the fact that with Stalin we were respected. And now mm -hmm. we are not anymore. So this is, I think, you have to think about the Russian mentality. Russian people are not uh, at the same level of evolution in their minds as we are. They have uh, much; they are much more conservative, and uh, this is a, this this entails a, a major misunderstanding between the two, which explains, you know, the the. The continuation of the war. I, I'm afraid this war will not end. Or if it ends, it will end us all. <laughs> because you see, no. you can't you, you don't fool around with someone who has six thousand nuclear uh, mm -hmm. nuclear heads. It's very dangerous. <laughs> Maybe I could I could say something about the the, the great man theory of history which is what you're talking about, I think. Uh, that's where a, um, that's where the biblical tradition should intervene on our behalf because in the biblical tradition, you have Jeremiah, second Isaiah, Christ himself, St. Stephen, St. Paul, uh, the, all these people, <laughs> Who are self-sacrificial in the in the in the richest sense of that term, and therefore they become the great men and women of history. These are people like Mother Teresa, uh, Saint Paul, Jeremiah. Uh, this is an, a way of seeing history uh, from God's point of view, if if you will, and because we. In in Western uh, modernity, have have completely forgotten that it's erased or it's set off to the side. Uh, we default back again to the to the great man theory, and and without those those many anonymous uh, people, parents of children, uh, uh, people who lead ordinary lives and uh, who manage nevertheless to to uh, live self-sacrificially uh, this uh, if if we if our if our faith was robust we would not lose sight of the, the fact that these are the people that we need uh, and we Absolutely. would hold them up we would hold them up I mean you, you you, to, to make to make them into a statuary would probably be to to miss the point, but nevertheless to to recognize that that's the apex of human existence uh, to live a self-sacrificial life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I completely agree. I completely agree. This is why I think you know the world now is is just manipulated by mimetic rivalry. And forgetting all about, you know, uh, God and 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 charity and and uh, you know, uh, don't retaliate if somebody hits you and things like that. Nowadays, not only they retaliate, but they, they hit him twice. <laughs> I just think, I just think, you know, you mentioned the evolution of the mind. I don't know. I wonder, <clears throat> for example, uh, Soleimani was the guy that was killed by the last president of America, you know, and he was on his way to deliver a message of peace from Iran to Saudi Arabia. And he was killed, assassinated. And I think about was what that, does that, was that? Yeah. Was that Soleimani, the guy that was the top guy in Iran that was assassinated by president Trump. He was, you know, this was in the last administration. Oh yeah. Yeah. And Soleimani, that he was, yes. he yeah, was so, a general. Yes. Yes. So he was killed, you know, but on the way to try to make, he had a letter of peace that he was making with Iran to Saudi Arabia. And I think about that, and I think 
what does that say about what Jesus has called us to be, to be the peacemakers, the fact that our our entire economy in America and the West is predicated on doing things to stop peace, to stop cordiality, well, you know, to stop the, you know the, the, connecting. In, Amer- in America and in the whole world, and uh, the, the the main the main industry is the industry of weapons, armaments. Yeah. So if you if you build a lot of armaments and you accumulate atomic bombs and 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 uh, whatever. You're not getting ready for peace. <laughs> Actually, okay. you're getting ready for war. We have to be yeah. to face it. Yeah, I just think that that it, there's something about you know if if I've always said on my radio program if Vladimir Putin wanted to get the West on his side, all he would have to do is come out in higher heels than Zelensky wore back in the day and say, "I declare myself Vladimira. I am now a female, and I'm coming to give you my truth." And that would make the West, oh, my God, you are the true savior of Russia. Thank you so much. Ukraine, (laughs) bye-bye. So we found a new lover. That's all you have to do. So it is a clash of ideals that motivates these countries to have these conflicts. Oh, yes. There's, there's, you know, several layers, several layers. You know, a a military layer, an economic layer, a political layer, a mimetic under layer. So sort of, you know. And, and psychological, cultural, religious. There's so many layers, and all these layers are in conflict between the two, between the West yeah. and, and the East. This, so I can't see any way to make peace. I can't see any, any person in the world uh, with enough authority to, to do it. The only person who could eventually do it would be a president of the United States. Who would decide to make peace? Yeah. He would take a plane, go first of all to Kiev, and tell Zelensky, listen, Zelensky, my friend, let's make ceasefire. And let me tell you that by rebuilding your country that's been destroyed, you will benefit more, you will have more money and more happiness, and your people will not will stop being killed your people will be happier. So please, you know, accept the ceasefire. And then he would take the same plane, fly to Putin in Moscow, and tell him, listen, my friend, you're exhausting your people. You're fighting a war but in which you're losing and killing a lot, a, lot, a lot of people without any purpose. You see, don't compare yourself to Stalin. Stalin was eliminating people that were some kind, you know, maybe in his view, worthless. But you're killing people that are young, that, 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 that are energetic, that, that, that can produce a new Russia. So please accept the ceasefire. That will be in your benefit. It will be in your interest. So a, a president of the United States who would say that, and would say, listen, I am ready. If you do that, we as Americans, we will help both of you. We will have both of you rebuild, reconstruct, and arrange your, your 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 people. Then he would do it. That's the only way. The only way is the president of the United States that can do it. It's not China. It's not India. It's not. It's the United States. Whoever that president United- is will have to go through an almost impenetrable gauntlet of uh, intelligence agencies and media apparatuses that do not want that kind of a president in that yeah. position to do that, unfortunately. <laughs> but I God can do anything, right. you know? God is able to do whatever. I don't know, but I really think that uh, a president of the United States who would be really willing to make peace could do it, could yeah. do it. Because wanna... he has to he has to emphasize to, to both, you know, mimetic rivals that they would be, that they would benefit much more from peace with his help then they would benefit from end, continuing the war, which is going to exhaust them. Both. I want to ask, and, and besides the threat of nuclear annihilation, which is a big deal, I want to ask about the, the general cultural trajectory that we're on, and I want to get your opinion on it as both mimetic theorists. When you look at the, the uh, normalization of undifferentiation, of making, you know, uh, making it completely prestigious to... Uh, annihilate one's uh, 
di- gender distinctions and so forth, right? When that becomes such a norm, we I call that, you know, basically the consecration of carnival. You know, carnival used to be the occasion by which the pagans would let their steam out. Now we've consecrated that as the new normal. And the only, t- I guess it's going to be eventually carnival will be when everybody actually acts like the gender there was, they were born with, you know, that will be the carnival when everybody actually is just male and female for a moment. But, uh, but my point is when you see this and you see how, you no, know, in America, you go to Victoria's secret and the mannequins are morbidly obese now because we don't want to offend what the aspirations of, of beauty would look like. And now it's a big giant mannequin to represent what women should want to be like. When you see Black Lives Matter and all these different things, isn't this a sign that Jesus is winning? Because the devil is having to, like a hermit crab, hide under the guise of ever more elaborate forms of victim identities to continue his act. And it's like, if it, if you were a thousand, you know, back in the Roman Empire days, when Jesus came, He didn't have to hide like a victim. You know, if you were Caesar, off with your head, be done with you. Now, everything is so Christianized that that Satan has to come in the image of Christ to even get a chance at having his game play. So does that mean Jesus is winning, right? I would say two things. Uh, First of all, there is indeed a competition in uh, what Rene told me once. There is a competition in... Uh, uh, victim victim aristocracy Mm -hmm. you see (laughs) you have to be more victim than the other victim in other words there is now a a, a mimetic rivalry between victims and I'm more victim than you are because I'm obese and whatever the second remark I would like to make is that when you you, you, you tell people that they can decide from one minute to the other, that I am a woman. It means that they reject the idea that they have been created by God. They have the right to create themselves. They generate themselves. They decide about themselves. If they decide they are a woman, fine. They can tomorrow, I mean, I can decide tomorrow that I'm a cat or that I'm, uh, I don't know. But this is me, it means that I am asserting that I am self generating, that I am the creation. I'm, 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 I, I can create myself. In other words, I don't need anybody else. I reject the idea of being created. And then, well, then that, 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 I, that idea is, is being crammed down the throats of all the young people in this country, probably more or less in the Western world, but especially in this country. And they're being being indoctrinated in in that understanding of of their complete and total autonomy, not only socially and culturally, but their 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 ability to autonomously define themselves in any way they see fit, changing it at any time and so on. And this is a recipe for mental illness and for and for tremendous confusion culturally and individually. I mean, we're feeding our children right now into these educational institutions that are that are corrupting them in a very very profound way and that's that's the next generation or two and if if we don't intervene I, as a christian one always has to be to to, to uh trust that uh, god uh, can help us and that we can be inspired to in some way be part of the solution but uh, we we really are uh, pretty far down the road in the West, and if it if it's not, I mean I think it's it's as Renee so often said it's an objectively apocalyptic situation, not only in terms of weaponry and mimetic rivalry, but in terms of the breakdown of the understanding of the human person. 
and the mystery of the person that you can't just tamper with that. It, it's, it's, uh, so, so I think it's, it's a very critical time, but I, but, uh, a, a Christian has to believe that the spirit can be awakened. And I think it's entirely possible that the, that the manifest absurdity of so many of these current fashions uh, will begin to uh, alert people to the, to the fact that we need something else. And, per, and then with the help of those of us who are Christians, maybe they can be made to realize that uh, that help has been part of our culture for 2,000 years or for 5,000 years. Yeah, and and uh, and if we, you know, make our way back and rediscover, I mean, these these the reason reason this tradition has lasted for as long as it has is because we rediscover it over and over again. We lose it and rediscover it, and I just pray that we can. And this is what what I tried to do in in my uh, last book and in this book is to emphasize uh, the importance of uh, faith. And uh, without it, uh, uh, without me, you can do nothing, Jesus says in John. Without me, you can do nothing. And this, my upcoming book, I start off by saying that nothing of which Jesus spoke is the nihilism. That exists yeah, yeah. because these uh, this idea that I can create myself and do this and that and so on that's nihilism, and and so it just means that there's nothing true, and so I can make it up as I go along. So you but don't you, share you don't share my kind of optimism that these flamboyant victim identity movements in the West are a sign that Satan's on the run and he's having to masquerade more and more ridiculous guises of victimism. I, I see it as triumphant of Christ. Not It doesn't mean that it's everything's going to be easy, obviously. I mean, I'm living in that generation you're talking about that's very confused about gender and so forth, but I see it as a cornered animal. You know, Satan's in a corner, and he's putting on... If there was a, a movie, uh, a Batman, 1992 film by Michael Keaton, you know, Michael Keaton played Batman, and Joker was played by Jack Nicholson, and Batman had him on the run and he was punching. He had him and he was punching him and he's punching him. And Jack, he, the, the Joker was out of ideas. He grabbed some glasses and put them on and said, you wouldn't hit a man with glasses, would you? And uh -huh. that's what I feel like Satan's doing. He's saying, you know, you wouldn't hit a person who's confused in their gender. Look at this poor person. He's been picked on. He's been bullied. You wouldn't hit on this obese person. You wouldn't hit on this minority. My goodness. Oh, how could you, you know, it's having to hide more and more. I think this is a sign that Christ's conscious uh, understanding of the victim is just like Jesus predicted when, remember when the religious authority said, tell your followers to be quiet when he was arriving into Jerusalem. And he said, it, when they are silent, the stones will cry out. And if you read Habakkuk chapter two, what he's quoting, that passage says, and the knowledge of the Lord will fill the world as the ocean is wet. And I think that's precisely what we see right now, that the unveiling of the scapegoat mechanism is so acute in the West that it's causing a fever dream of all these forms of victimisms that are popping up as a satanic ruse to, dis to, to distract us from what's really being revealed, which is the slain lamb, right? I'm I, trying, think, I feel optimistic about this, except for the nuclear yeah. possibility. That's a little scary. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think David, I, I, I see. <laughs> no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I'm just that I, I'm just going to say that David, that is, that is a good way to look at it, and and uh, there is an undoubtedly truth to that, uh, whether or not. Uh, but I think it's, I, I think uh, everything is still being weighed in the balance. That it could, we we have to we have to bring. A, a Christian and, and 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 at the anthropological level of mimetic, but in a more profound way, a Christian or Judeo-Christian uh, point of view to to play on all of this because uh, left to its own, there's a, there's no no 
no amount of damage that cannot be done by these absurdities. The fact that they are patently absurd is is uh, to our advantage in the sense that you're speaking. I agree with that, uh, but I, I wouldn't I, w I wouldn't celebrate our victory quite yet, <laughs> or the victory or the victory of of uh, you know Christ and Moses. I, I don't think we're. <laughs> I, I think that's although you never know it might sometimes in history things unexpectedly suddenly there's a there's a shift. We should pray for that too. The only thing I'm afraid about is that this shift and this awakening will take place only when a terrible war uh -huh. will will happen, and that will bring everybody back to their senses and 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 to reality. They will see that they they cannot just decide what what they do, what happens to them, and so on, and that things happen to them that they. They can do nothing about And now they refuse that. You know, mm -hmm. God, what do you mean? God made me a man, but I didn't want that. He didn't ask me what I wanted to do. He didn't make me. I can make myself. Yeah. And me, myself, I make myself a woman. And, and you know, and I see many patients sometimes who have taken that decision when they were like the teen teenagers. They have become women, female, yeah. and then they want to have children, they want to be uh, pregnant, but then eventually when they are 40 or 50, they want to get back to being man. And and and, and the surgeons have a problem there. <laughs> so you see, I mean, actually, from a psychiatric point of view, they are crazy. You know, I thought that's not. Ago, I thought you're not allowed to say that anymore. The word crazy. <laughs> I know, I know. Nobody's crazy anymore. But you see, uh, 50 years ago or 60 years ago, when I started being a student in psychiatry, if someone had walked into my office and said, "You know, a man with a beard and everything," saying, "I am a woman," he would have been immediately put in in a in a room, and 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 you know, be labeled as, as a schizophrenic or whatever, a deluded, crazy, and he would have been taken care of with, with uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, therapeutic means. Nowadays, if he says, I'm a woman, everybody says, well, we haven't realized, but of course we, we <laughs> yes, you are right. <laughs> you know, I think it's a kind of, it's a kind of pseudo Gnosticism that's emerging from the foundation of materialism. It's not true Gnosticism because they don't believe in anything outside of matter. Right. But it's like a, it's like a, it's like a synthetic form of Gnosticism that's emerging as a, as a need for our materialistic scientism worldview needs some kind of mentalism because we've tried to suppress body, soul, spirit, that it has to come out with some kind of, fabricated version of spirit and that's what we have today where people are living in the mind you know i identify as this i identify as that that's a kind of mentalism right yeah, yeah. but yeah. it's this i mean you know they have they, they, they let me tell you a few a few months ago they uh, asked me to uh, to to make a conference about what i thought about the evolution uh, all we're discussing now. And I said, no, I can't make a conference like that because this world is not my world anymore. So mm. people cannot understand what I will say and I will not understand what they feel, what they hear. You know? Because what is important is not so much what you say, is what the other one hears. Mm -hmm. And now more and more, there's a discrepancy between the two. <laughs> You see, yeah. you can you can say things which are very profound and sound and reasonable, but what they hear is something completely different. They hear, here's an old idiot who is still hanged with you know with the old ideas. Let's just erase him. Mm -hmm. Let him you know, let him go to bed and. <laughs>
I, I have two quick questions for you, then we'll wrap it up. I know you guys have been very generous with your time, but you have you guys are great to hear, learn from while we have you. One is, this is a question of mine. I've been going through the book Hostage to the Devil by Malachi Martin. He was a, a priest. Uh, he left the Jesuit order, and he was a Catholic priest. He was famous for uh, introducing the reality of, of demonic possession in America. His book Hostage to the Devil came out in 1970s. And it chronicles five American possessions in contemporary times. One of those possessions is a person who believes that he's a woman and he's possessed by a spirit that convinces him to do all kinds of heinous things. This was in the 1960s, by the way. He goes through with the surgery, which I was at the time. I said, I didn't know they even had such surgeries available for people in the 1960s. But this was New York City where the, where the story is recorded. But Malachi Martin was well known for being critical of a lot of the things that you guys are talking about, where the modernism of, of you know kind of challenging some of the foundations of the church. But in his story, he he recounts that these possessions are real diabolical spirits. Now, I say that just to say some people have criticized Rene Girard's comments about Satan being not a being, but rather the absence of being, of being a parasitical being. At the same time, I think there are spiritual entities at play as Malachi Martin references. He talks about, you know, people levitating and knowing these things that are just beyond just supernatural things that are not, you can't explain it as a, uh, as a purely psychological or mimetic phenomenon. So I wanted to get both of your perspective on, do you believe these spiritual entities are real? Are they beings or are they just a manifestations of human uh, you know, mimetic uh, sicknesses uh, purely? Well, I would say that, that evil operates autonomously uh, and uh, so, to, uh, so to imagine evil as a demonic being is, is not uh, incorrect. So uh, I so uh, the demonic exists. It has an autonomy. It's real. It it uh, it can it can smother a life, uh, confuse and disorient. So these are uh, that's that's a real that's a real issue. That's in my opinion. That's so I don't think it's a mistake to think of evil as a being. Uh, I, I remember Renee who more than once said um, uh, Satan likes to convince us that he does. His, his first delusion is to convince us that he doesn't exist. But then Renee said his second delusion is to convince us that he does. Yeah. Because in a way we're Casting out Satan uh, is is a casting out. Mm -hmm. isn't it? So, uh, but I think evil is real. Well, it, it certainly it it certainly looks like it. <laughs> it certainly manifests yeah. itself. Yeah, I, I, have, I, I think I fully agree with Gil. I have nothing more to say. Yeah. Well, my final question for both of you then is, as someone, you know, first of all, I want to know, when's the last time you guys saw each other? And secondly, for folks who are young in the audience who are trying to decide, hey, I want to be a part of advancing research in the field of mimetic theory and the different ways that you have partitioned your work. You, you know, you, Dr. Gorlian, you said you focused on psychology. And uh, Mr. Bailey, I believe you focus more on theology and, and then, you know, you dabble in different ways. But what would you say to folks who are interested in, hey, I want to be a young scholar and advance and build on the work and explore this discipline and, and develop it further? Where would you point them in the direction, some some advice, some tips, some recommendations to 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 join you in your footsteps in advancing these ideas? You know, the 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 the, the, the main fact is that you know I have no uh, followers. I have no students. And uh, today, if my book sells 
10 or 15 or 150 copies in the world, you know, any, any TikTok or any uh, uh, <laughs> thing saying, has billions of followers or millions of followers immediately. So how can we compete? We cannot. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes it happens. It happened once this year. There is a guy that came to me and said, you know, I've, read, I've been reading some of your books and I would like to talk to you because I think there's something in that what you say that is interesting. That's the only one. He won every year. Mm -hmm. you know, out of... <laughs> so, Don't forget our invitations think, on our show, right? Are we... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I would say to, some, to answer that question specifically, David, I would say uh, the mothership from from which all the branches, uh, that's mixing a metaphor, uh, is things hidden since the foundation of the world, to which uh, Jean-Michel contributed tremendously. Yes. And, and that, uh, for somebody who, because in that you, you have it more or less recessively the Christian, Judeo-Christian thing, it, it's, it's uh, throughout the book, but it's a it's a so it's like a minor theme, but you have you have the historical, the psychological, uh, you know, and it's very very it's a very rich conversation, and of course I've always been mimetically jealous. That I was not able to sit and not and not speak a word and just listen to that conversation. But anyway, that was the, that was one of uh, Jean Michel's real contributions to because you stimulated Renee's thought. Right. And this is why you see when I went back to Paris with the manuscript, uh, Francoise Verny was the head of the Grasset uh, publisher, and she looked at me and she said, "Boy, you've made Renee produce all that." <laughs> You're not a psychiatrist. You're a gynecologist. <laughs> <laughs> you gave birth to Renee's thought. And uh, so we laughed about that and everything. But it's true that uh, I was fascinated by Renee's book, Violence of the Sacred. And I suddenly realized that this approach, this new approach, mimetic approach, would be a revolution in the comprehension of psychology and psychiatry, which have been had been completely distorted and uh, misunderstood and uh, fantasized by a variety of psychoanalyses, you know, uh, creating things, creating creatures that didn't exist, like the unconscious, you know, <laughs> and. Uh, so, so I, I was fascinated, and I told Rene, and his his answer was in that was in 1973. And and Rene said, "No, I, you know, I'm I'm not a psychologist. How how can you believe that? Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a literary uh, uh, specialist, and so on." I said, "No, no, no. What you have discovered in the psychology of the of the main." characters of the of the of the of the novels that you comment on is a lesson of psychology that has to be explored and exploited and i've passed since that time i've only done that i've only done my my homework in that direction uh -huh. so how did you guys record one that day somebody will appreciate how did some i think many people do appreciate both of your work and i think a lot of people you know there's a lot of quiet fans out there that are are fascinated and and enriched and have been drawn to the faith because of these uh, scholarly ideas that you guys have helped. Uh, I mean, I know I've been edified by both of your works and many others that we have listening to this program all over the world. And uh, I have to commend you both for that. I want to ask you though, while you mentioned it, how did you guys record that? Where was it at? And how many days did it take the whole, the whole story about it? But that? I tell you, I tell you, we, we, uh, I, I went to the States with, with the tape recorder we had a conversation for two few few days. Where was this at? Was back. this in Stanford, or this is before that, right? Yeah. No, no, no. Then Buffalo, Buffalo, Buffalo. Okay. In Cheektowaga. Yeah. In Cheektowaga near Buffalo. 
that's where it started. And then when I came back to Paris, I, I, I wrote it, handwritten, ink handwritten. <laughs> then I gave it to my secretary who typed it. Then I mailed it to Rene, who uh, changed it and everything. Then he came to Paris and we re-discussed it. And again, I re re recorded. And we did that for five years. Five years. At the end, Rene restructured the whole thing. And I went to spend three, four months in Baltimore. Then he was in Johns Hopkins in 77. And I stayed there with my family. Rene arranged us to rent a house there, a house of one of his colleagues. And uh, we worked every morning until night. Uh, one day, even at 10 p.m., we were running around trying to find the text of Freud, you know, uh, and uh, we didn't have it. He didn't have it. I didn't have it. So he went to his uh, colleague and friend, very important, uh, Dick Maxey, who had a fantastic library. And we ring the bell and Dick Maxey comes out in pajamas and says, well, what the hell are you doing here at 10 p.m.? <laughs> And Rene says, we are looking for Freud's <laughs> work. <laughs> and, and, and Dick Max says, are you both crazy? And all right, I'll go and find, and find out if I have it. And he comes out after half an hour of looking and searching in his library. And he says, didn't, I didn't find it in French. I didn't find it in English. I found it in German. And Rene said, OK, I'll manage. Give it to me. <laughs> and so we went and continued the discussion. He because I don't speak German, he was translating German, so that we discussed it on his translation until midnight or something like that. No, we, we worked that very, very hard for three, four months, from morning to night. Did what you feel? And, and at the what? end, we had the we had the nine hundred page book. Did you feel? Did you feel when you guys were working all day and night that we're onto something very exciting? This is going to be big. Oh, this is exciting. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and you yeah. see, on my side, there was. Uh, uh, admiration, um, respect, and eagerness to learn. Because I, I thought to myself, this would not happen to any normal human being to have so much to learn from someone exceptional. And Rene, on his part, uh, it was indulgence. Uh, he, he thought, you know, here's a guy who is interested. Why not? Because he seems to be not totally stupid. He seems to understand what I'm saying. <laughs> and not only that, but he seems to be interested and to understand. So I'm, you know, he was induced into telling me more and explaining more. And I was sometimes asking silly questions, but he would answer any question. That was very fascinating experience. Very fascinating experience. And well, then, I, yeah. I, thank you, David, for having us so that yeah. That, exp that experience is now r recorded for the exactly. world to know. Exactly. Very, well, Gil, let me tell important. you, Gil, it's, it's been great seeing you again. And uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll get together sometime, you know, either in California or in, in Europe. Hope to see you, you soon. If you come to California, please let me know. Of course, of course. There's no yeah. problem. If, yeah. You know, but, but I'm an old man now. You know, I can't travel that easily anymore. Yeah, I'm not so young myself. Uh, David, I wonder. <laughs> Thank you. I wonder if I could, if I could, as we close, share something that just appeared. It's a little book that's called the the uh, D Divine Project, and it's a collection. It's a lectures that uh, Ratzinger gave in uh, in 1985, mm -hmm. and in it is this passage. We receive our lives each day from without, from others who are not ourselves, yet relate us, relate to us in some way. Man's self is not contained only within himself, but exists almost even more so outside of himself. Man is relational, and his life, his very self, only exists by way of a relationship. I, by myself, am not I, but am, am so only in relation to a thou. And it is thus 
it is the Tao that makes me myself. To be truly human means to subsist in the relationship that is love. Now, uh, 1985... This, is, this could have been written by Rene. Exactly. You know? Exactly. I'm impressed. I'm very impressed. 1985, that, you said? Wow. 1985. And that was those were lectures that were never published. And as a matter of fact, they only retrieved them from cassette tapes of the lecture. The, show show the, me the book again. Show me the book again, please. The Divine Project. The Divine Project by Gretzinger. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to try and get it. Okay. Thank you, yeah. guys, both That's of you. Nice. Very, it's been an honor to talk to you. Thank you, Gil. Real treat. Nice thank to you see both. you. My... And yes, thanks so much. All the best to you both. Huh? Okay. Bye-bye. We'll stay in touch. Bye -bye.